I set up everything and then I forgot to click the button, start recording. I mean, how hard can it be, right? <clears throat> All right. So um, we'll get started with um, string compare, but we'll do it in a recursive way. Okay, so most people do string compare using a, you know, a loop of some kind, but we're going to do it recursively. So, and I cannot name it, you know, using um, the same name. So the first thing I need to do is a string uh, pound includes sddint.h, so I can use the integer types here that I need to use. <clears throat> the return type is an int 8 underscore t, which is a signed 8-bit integer. And I cannot use the name, you know, string compare, so I'm just going to do S uh, CMP for string compare, because if I use the regular name, the linker won't like it, because string compare is a name in the library. So when I use the same name, the linker is not is going to get confused and not like it. It will be uh, it will take two strings, okay? St uh, cons char you know string one, cons char you know string two. <clears throat> so those are the uh, arguments. So the way I'm going to do this is to do it recursively. When you do anything recursively, you have to think about when do I stop talk calling you know the function recursively. In other words. What is the con what is the condition or conditions where I can make I can return a value right away because I know the answer, okay? So if both s1 and s2 are pointing to a null value, I can return it. If one is pointing to a null value, the other one is not, I can still return the value. You know, and and it depends on it doesn't depend on which one is null. In other words, if at least one of s1 or s2 is pointing to a null character. I know the ordering between the, between the strings already. <clears throat> I can also return right away if uh, whatever S1 points to and whatever S2 points to are different, because at that point, the two strings are different, and I know the ordering at that point already. So let's see how we can express those things. So we can say, <clears throat> so we specify the condition and say if S1 does not equal to whatever S2 is pointing to, I, I know the answer already, okay? So this is one thing I can do, you know, I can return right away. Or if at least one of them is a null, I can also return a null also. So I can say or uh, whatever S1 points to is null. And the other way to say this is, the more concise way to say this, which is um, a little bit more cryptic, is that, okay? Because you know, um, the logical knot of whatever S1 points to is the same thing as asking is whatever S1 pointing to a zero, okay? Or the other one is you know, if S2 is pointing to a null character, I can also terminate right away. So that means you know, I have three conditions that I can rely on. They're con they're, they are connected by a sim simple or. If any one of these conditions is true, I know the answer already. All right, so the next question is, um, can I use the same expression to express the answer. So here's the question mark, separating the condition from the then value of the ternary expression. So the return value when one of these conditions is true is simply whatever S1 points to minus whatever S2 points to, okay? So let's check whether that makes sense or not. The first one, you know, the first condition here is when whatever S1 points to is not the same as whatever S2 is pointing to, then I know the two strings are different already. I don't need to go any further. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so if one string is ABC, the other one is XYZ, the A and the X are different, and I can tell that you know, ABC is less than XYZ already. So in that case, if I take the ASCII code of A and subtract from it the ASCII code of X, that should, be, that should give me a negative value because the ASCII code of X is greater than the ASCII code of A. So do I care about the actual quantity, how far on the negative side? No, the standard only says it has to be a negative value. So as long as it is it's negative, I'm fine. The opposite way is the same. So if I want to compare XYZ to ABC, same conclusion, okay? I only need to look at the first character of each string and be able to determine you know, the ordering. And in, in the case of XYZ being S1, and ABC being S2, then I return a positive value to basically indicate the first string is greater than the second string. Is that okay? What about one of them is null? 
Well, if one of them is null, okay, so if I get past this point, if whatever S1 points to does equal to whatever S2 points to, that's the only time I will look into the second one. So that means the third one is actually not necessary. Because by the time I get to not at asterisk S1, what does it mean? How do I get to <clears throat> this condition when I have what we call lazy evaluation or short-circuited logic evaluation? Does, do you guys remember what that means? In the or? Yes, go ahead. So in this case, if the first condition is true, I don't bother to evaluate the second one. So I only bother to evaluate the second one if the first one is false. So what does it mean when the first condition, this one, is false? They are the same. Whatever S1 points to has the same ASCII code as whatever S2 is pointing to. So if I also confirm that whatever S1 pointing to is null, that also confirms whatever S2 points to is a null. So that means this part here, it will never get here. Now, does it make the program any long, any, uh, does it take the program to execute longer when I have the third condition? The answer is no, because you know, it won't get to that point. So now what we do is, you know, but would it still make sense if both S1 and S2 are both pointing to a null character? What does it mean when they're both pointing to a null character? Say again? Um, it is initialized. So the null character serves a special purpose in a C string. What does it do? It is called a, the string terminator. So that means, oh, we are at the end of a string already, which means everything before that null terminator, they have to be the same in order to get to this point. Or I was given a null string to begin with, a string that has no characters in it. So if I have two empty strings, should I consider them the same? Yeah, okay. So that means you know, this condition makes sense. <clears throat> so now we have to specify the false value, which means you know, if the condition is false, what should I return in that case? This is where we have to go for the, rec the recursion. So we basically just go like, okay, since whatever S2, S1 is pointing to and whatever S2 is pointing to cannot determine the order, hopefully the rest of the string can resolve that. So all we have to do is to say, look at the rest of both of those strings and whatever that ordering is, is my answer as well. Does that make sense? In other words, I have ABC in one string, ABD in, oh, yeah, ABC on one string, ABD on the other string. So when we compare the first character, they're both A, right? So that means I cannot determine the order yet. But I can now say, let's look at the next one. And it will be a B, C on one, B, D on the other one. And then since that is also the same, I still cannot determine the order, right? So we do another level of recursion. We get to the third level of recursion. Then one would be a C, the other would be a D. And at that point, I can determine ABC is less than ABD, and I can start to return after that point. All right? <clears throat> so, uh, so this is just a recursive call to look at the rest of the string. That's basically what it means. So this is string compare, okay, but looking kind of weird, okay? But I hope by now you guys are already used to weird in this class. All right, so what we'll do is we're just gonna test it out and do a SCMP, and in C, you know, we can just go ahead and use a literal string, so we can compare ABC, just as I said a little bit earlier, versus ABD as the second string, and then we have a return zero here. It doesn't print anything, just as usual. Uh, there's no printf, there's no, um, there's no uh, C out, you know, nothing like that, because I can look at the register A on line 13, so I can actually tell what the, what the re return value is. And the return value in this case should be negative, because ABC is less than ABD as strings. Okay, is that okay? Okay, so we, we have some expectations of what should happen when we run this code. <clears throat> All right, save the code. Go to a your command line interface. And you will go ahead and GD, GCC compile. 
with debug information, uh, dash O, we'll call this SCMP, and the source code is scmp.c. I think both of these are in the folder. Oh, <clears throat> the program is actually called string compare, so there we go. That's the name of the executable. This is the name of the source file. It compiled just fine. <clears throat> then we go into, we use GDB to look into the rest of the program. I'll put two breakpoints, okay? One breakpoint is on line four, which is at the entry point of the string compare function, which is right here. And the other breakpoint is on line 13, which is right after it returned all the way back to main, because I want to look at register A to see what the return value is. So now we run the code. <clears throat> So as you can see here, the first level of invocation is comparing the very beginning of both strings. So we are comparing ABC versus ABD. And at this point, the ternary expression, we will look at A versus A and say they are the same, and yet they are none of them is null. So that means it's gonna call recursively. But when it calls recursively, is it's gonna pass the rest of the string, which means it would be uh, BC versus BD at the next invocation level. So we do a continue. And as you can see, now we have BC versus BD. But the other thing you also want to confirm is, are we making completely new strings or are we really looking, are we really looking at a substring as if it is a new string? So when you compare the address <clears throat> of S1 or what S1 is pointing to, it's at a location of 0, 08. And this one is at a location of 0, 09. So that confirms that we are really just looking at the same string, but a subpart of the original string. <clears throat> and of course, in this case, B and D are the same. So when we continue one more time, this time we'll be comparing C versus D. They are different, okay? So that means you know, this time we are, not we are not going to go for the recursion, and instead it's, it will start to return. Okay, it will return whatever the difference is between C and D, which is a negative one. Okay, so when we do another continue, it will go all the way back to main, right on the line of return zero, okay, right there. So now we can look at you know, IRRAX, which is the register A um, for the Intel architecture, and it's all Fs. Okay, so what do you think this is representing? You look at, look, you look at this value here and go like, tag, this doesn't look negative to me. But that's the unsigned, yeah, unsigned interpretation. When you look at the signed interpretation of all Fs as a 32-bit thing, it is actually a negative one. So this is how we confirm that the C code is working the way that we think it should be working. So once the C code, once we verify the C code is working, then we can start to work on the assembly code. Are we good so far? Okay. <clears throat> all right. So now we get out of here go back to the editor and start to work on the assembly code. So in the assembly code, you know, things get a little bit interesting. Um, we'll do the usual initialization first and then call main as if it is a normal function. So we have LDI A dot six plus, <clears throat> decrement D, ST, DA, JMPI to main. When it comes back, we can halt. So this is the entry code, it does not have a name. Um, it simply is the first thing that we do when the processor wakes up. So now we can define you know, the two subroutines, SCMP as one, and then main as the other one. So we'll deal with main first, okay? Main only has to call SCMP with the strings. But in this class, we have never talked about how a literal string is really represented. So what we need to kind of talk about that first. So what we need to do is to have the ability to define literal strings. So what exactly is a literal string? Sorry? Say again? A literal string. L-I-T-E-R-A-L, -E literal, and then string. So it's the double quote notation, but what exactly is it? Go ahead. It is an array of characters, very good. But what are we really passing to the subroutine? Are we passing all the characters or are we passing the address of the first byte of the characters? 
pointer to the first to the to the characters. So that means you know we have to have a way to represent an array of characters in assembly two. Okay. That turns out to be not too hard. Okay, so we will. I'll just use a double underscore as a prefix when we define the label that is representing a literal string, <clears throat> and we have this magical thing called byte, which can be used to say, for whatever strange reason, this is the value that we want that I want to put into this byte location. That's what byte is for. Okay, it's just you know a very flexible way to specify the content at a certain location. So now we need to look up what is the ASCII code of lowercase a. I believe that is 97. So that's you know, lowercase a. <clears throat> so that means b is 98. And then 99 is going to be the c. And then we also need one extra byte for the zero because we need the null terminator. So in C++ notation or C or C++ notation in a string, backslash zero is representing the null character. <clears throat> so we, this, that's how we define one string. The other string is ABC, ABD, sorry, and it's going to be about the same thing. So we'll just go ahead and copy all four of these bytes, except for the third one, because we want ABD. So I think that is 100 in decimal. So this is how we define literal strings in assembly language. Okay, we basically just use the byte directive, you know, to allocate four bytes for each one. And then we specify the actual value to go into those particular bytes. <clears throat> All right. So with that in mind, calling you know those calling the subroutine SCMP is really just pushing ABD first underscore underscore ABD, and then we push underscore underscore ABC. Yes. Do it cause issues in the assembly when you don't have a no terminator in the assembly? Well, without the no terminator, in this case, it would not be a problem because the compare thing is going to terminate by the time we get to the C versus the D. But if I have two strings that are identical, without a null terminator, they would move on to, it, it, it doesn't know when to stop. Okay. It wouldn't know when to stop. It will still stop in this case because um, if you don't say anything, the rest of the memory locations would all be zeros because when you restart when you restart the processor or when you restart the simulator, RAM is going to be empty you know, until you load something into it. It will be all zeros until you load something into it. But the null terminator is important. Without the null terminator, uh, then the string is technically not terminated. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> all right. So getting back to main. Uh, the first thing we need to do is to push ABD, and then we have to push ABC, and I'm referring to the names of the labels in this case. So we have to do LDI, A with underscore, underscore, ABD, decrement D, um, and then ST, DA, LDI, A with underscore, underscore, ABC, <clears throat> decrement D, ST, DA again. Then we have to push the return address, which is LDI, A, dot six plus decrement D S T D A and now we are ready to continue execution at the subroutine which is done by a JMPI instruction. So JMPI to SCMP. And when it comes back, how many things are still sitting on the stack that I don't need anymore? Two, exactly. Because the return address is handled by the function. The function will pop the return address. So it is the two arguments that will still be sitting on the stack. So that means I have to do an increment D and another increment D to get rid of the two arguments that are still sitting on the stack. And then at that point, I'm done with main and main itself can return. So that's the usual sequence of returning, which is LDBD increment D and JMPB. So that's how we return to a caller. So I claim that this is what main is going to do. <clears throat> and then we go to SCMP. The first thing I'm going to do is to just make it return, you know, and not to do any computation. So we'll just go ahead and do LD, I, LD, B, D, increment D, and then JMPB, just so that I can test the program at this point to make sure that I don't run into any issues before I even start to um, 
you know, implement the actual logic in SCMP. All right, so are there any questions? I have a question. Are we still recording? The answer is yes, we are still recording. Okay, because I do have to check sometimes you know, I click something accidentally and it will stop the recorder. So I do have to check it occasionally. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm not going to waste time, you know, you know, doing everything manually. So I'm going to use River Spider to kind of save time. So I'm going to use submit. Um, this is string compare dot ttpasm. <clears throat> uh, okay, I forgot one important thing. I did not save the file. Classic. All right, let's do it one more time. Yeah, so it works this time. Go back to the browser. We go to the assembler. And if you go to the source tab, you can see that this is the new program that we have been writing. And then if the whole thing is done, we can go to the analysis tab. And I believe this is also the correct thing to do. So we start with the no op instruction, which is at the entry code. We initialize the stack pointer. We push the return address. Okay, using these three instructions, we continue execution at main. This is at main. Main is first pushing the address of the first, the second string, which is ABD. Then they push the first string, which is ABC. Then they push the return address on the stack. And then we continue execution at SCMP. SCMP doesn't do a single thing. It just returns right away. So these three instructions is how we return from a callee. We clean up the stack because there are two arguments that are still sitting on the stack. And then we, um, and then what do we do? That is interesting because it does not say anything after that. So after the two increment, So after the two increment, we have the usual return, which is LDBD, increment D, and then JMPB back to the halt instruction. So according to the analysis tab, it did not know what happened after that. But we did end up to in the same halt instruction, which is on line, uh, which is at location 08. It's just that you know, for some strange reason, the trace, the analyzing of the trace did not come up with the line number or the content of the lines. All right, so I can fix that later. This is a bug in the um, trace analyzer. Um, but the program executed correctly. It went all the way back to the halt instruction. The stack point is back to zero, which means the stack is balanced, okay? It is empty by the time we get to the halt instruction. So the program executed correctly. It's just that, you know, for some reason, I'm going to have to find that out, you know, that it did not, you know, go back and report all the line numbers. So I have a certain idea of why that is the case. So let me just kind of look this up really quickly. And it's probably referring to the wrong value. So A2 versus A1. Yeah, I think it should be using A2 here. All right, I will take a look later. <laughs> so the VLOOKUP ALA formula. Yeah, I think this is supposed to be A1. And this is also supposed to be A1. Okay, well, it did show the line numbers, so I think it has two different things here, uh, A1 and A1. There we go. So that's A1, and that's also A1. All right, problem fixed. <laughs> Live debugging. All right, so the tool is now fixed, and we can actually get back to the usual you know, stuff. So what this has shown right now is you know, I know what is happening on the stack. Now, when you are writing your code, okay, so I am demonstrating this to help you, you know, to get your program, you know, written 
over the weekend because you have two programs here to be written um, and they are related okay one is not really harder than the other one this is you know this program that I'm writing here is harder than both of the programs that you have to write all right so um, when you run this code okay before you look at the trace analyzer you should know what is supposed to be on the stack okay so that's the first thing you need to know is as this program runs, do I know what is on the stack? And the way you do that is to use a piece of paper or you can use a spreadsheet, okay? So I'm just gonna add a sheet for now that I can you know, kind of get rid of later on. <clears throat> so what you do is you look at locations. So this is FF, this is FE, FD, FC, FB, FA, and so on, okay? So I think you know, this program does use quite a bit of space you know, when it's all done. So now you look at all of these locations and you ask, what is going to be at that location? What is the first push of the entire program? It is the return address back to the entry code from main, okay? So this is the, a return address from main to the entry code. Now you don't have to document it as much as I do here. And then the next byte is going to be <clears throat> for the calling of uh, SCMP. So this is going to be the label um, ABD, which is the second argument. The second argument is pushed first. When did we learn about that? How did we learn about that? It is part of the caller callee agreement, okay? Because you know, they have to agree on where am I supposed to find what on the stack, okay? So this is all important, making relationship, relating what you're seeing you know, in the trace to the concepts you know, that we are learning is important. So now we have another return address, but this time it's from SCMP back to main. <clears throat> and the program should only use you know, um, locations on the stack down to FC. So now we go back to the trace itself, okay? And then we look at how, you know, where we wrote on the stack. And you can see here, FC is indeed, the, oh, not this one, but you look at column C, so FC is indeed the lowest location that we wrote to. That really is the return address from SCMP back to main. This is the address of um, underscore underscore ABC. This is the address of um, underscore underscore ABD. And this is the address back to the halt in the entry code. So now how do we know all this stuff here? You know, the, the assembler actually does not yet okay you know try to associate a label when it sees a number but what you can do is to go back to the assemble tab here and here you can look at the halt instruction the return address is supposed to be here okay we got the zero nine um you look at the next return address it is supposed to be after the jmpi instruction which is a 1b and we push that 1b on the stack and then you look at you know the address of ABC or the label underscore underscore ABC. It is indeed two zero. The uh, label underscore underscore ABD is indeed two four. And we can see that here too. You can see how you know ABC is starting at the address of two zero in hexadecimal, and you can also see how ABD is starting at the location of two four. So all of this is important. Okay. I know it sounds like, oh man, this is a lot of work. It is a lot of work, okay? Um, but by doing this, okay, not only are you double checking that the program itself as it is right now is working, because if it's not working at this point, if you're pushing the wrong thing on the stack, the function is not gonna work, okay? So that's why you really have to do it step by step, making sure whatever you're pushing on the stack is correct. Then you go in to try to implement the subroutine. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So now we go back to the program and then we continue with the development of the program. So now what we want to do is we have the big task of writing this code here. That's a lot of stuff, right? So if you're seeing something like this, what you might want to do is to say, let's not worry about the recursion. We're not going to give it a case that it would actually do the recursion. We'll just give it something where it is both empty strings or the first character is different to begin with. So there's no need to do the recursion. We only need um, to return you know, whatever S1 minus whatever, 
whatever S1 points to minus whatever S2 points to. So I'm simplifying the program to the point where, okay, I'm making this assumption that they are different. The first characters are different or they're both null to begin with. I just want to make sure that I can access S1, I can access S2, I can compute the difference between whatever they point to and just return that. Is that okay? So I'm simplifying the program to the point where only line six is the return value. I forget about the, I'm, I'm not gonna implement the conditional part, I'm not gonna implement the recursive part. Is that okay? All right, so that's what I'll do. So in the assembly code, that's exactly just you know, what I would do. So I would just write the comment to myself and say, okay, the following code, all it does is to compute whatever S2 points to minus whatever S1 points to. All right. So before we do that, there are a few things that I need to do too, because I need to know what the stack looks like, what the frame looks like. Now, have we talked about the concept of a frame? Okay, the frame is you know, basically the, a contiguous piece of memory on the stack that provides the context for a function to get its you know, whatever variable it has and also all the parameters that it has and also the return address. So that collectively is called a frame. So we want to look at the frame we have S2, and then we have S1, and then we have the return address. Now, since this particular function has no local variables, so that means the stack pointer will, point, it will end up pointing here when the entire frame is set up because there are no local variables whatsoever. Are we good so far? So now we define the uh, symbolic names. <clears throat> so return address is going to be at the same place that the stack pointer is pointing to and then SCMP um, S1 is the next one. So I personally like to make everything relative to each other, but you can certainly you know, use a shortcut and say, okay, that's just one and this one's just two. So you can do that if you want to, but personally, you know, I would do it something like this so that I can actually see and go like, they are relative to each other by you know, so many bytes. And those are, you know, the number of bytes is the size of each item. All right, so with this all set up, now I can go back here and use the usual technique of, okay, we need to access S2 and then we need to access S1. So this is how we get to S2, okay? So I'm gonna use register B for S2. Um, so the first thing we do is we get the offset into it. So this is the offset and then we compute the address out of the offset, but we don't need the address of S2, we want what it points to. So the next thing we need to do is the LD. So we get to S2, and then we get to whatever it points to. So in this case, we have two D references because, you know, so once again, I'm not commenting the code because I want to give you the program and then you end up commenting it, okay? Because as you comment it and you associate what we're doing here with what you have learned about the caller callie agreement and all the other stuff, that's how we study in this class, okay? Or that's one way to study in this class. Okay, so by this time, B is going to have whatever S2 is pointing to, and I can do the same thing with uh, whatever S1 is pointing to. So let me do the other one. So after this, I'm, we're gonna take row first, and then we'll continue with this code. So this is the offset, this is the address, this is the parameter itself, and this is what the parameter is pointing to. And now I just need to do a subtraction. And I just did something relatively dumb. So I'm gonna make some changes here. <laughs> it's not bad, it's just I, you know, I would end up doing something that is unnecessary. So if I put whatever value S2 is pointing to into, oh, guess what? Undo, 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 undo because I did the, okay, I have to redo now. Oh no, there's a redo, but I cannot remember. So what do we do? We ask, Vim redo, control R, there we go. Control R, Yoo-hoo! we got everything back. Okay, so this is, okay, I made the mistake because it's supposed to be like that. If it's like that, then, then I get the registers right already. Because when I do a sub, sub AB, it will do the calculation and put the result in register A, which is what I want. So what I do here is to do a sub AB and that will do the actual calculation. And then I have the usual return code here, which is fine. 
Okay, so let me just do a row taking thing first, and then we'll continue with this. All right, so today is the 22nd. The row taking word for today is recursion. Big surprise there. It is. Oh, I didn't. I did not reset it. Okay, so let me change all that. Yeah, right. Oh, right. Okay, so I forgot to made it a little bit earlier today. We'll make it thirty. There we go. Should be able to do it now. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. So as you guys are working on this, I'm going back to the program. I see most of you are done with that part already. Okay, so as I'm waiting for the other ones are to be done, um, I put Reefer Spider on a thumb drive. So when I need to work on the programs, you know, using Reefer Spider, I can now just plug in this thumb drive, go to a folder, double click on the file, and it will start up the environment that I need. And then I can use you know, the same tool that I have, you, have been using here, um, and you know it's really convenient. The only thing that you have to install on that computer first is Java. So um, I think all the lab computers here, and also the lab computers upstairs in 301, they all have Java installed already. I double checked. Okay, I ran everything from the thumb drive this morning, and they all worked. Okay, so that means you know for the people who are using Windows and you're not using, you're not bringing your own device, um, you can now put everything onto a thumb drive every time you come to class. You know, when you do the programming in the lab or whatnot, you can just plug this in, use the tool, and then you know, it's, it's just convenient. <clears throat> but I had a really slow USB drive, so it took me 15 minutes, five zero minutes, to copy the content, 1.2 gigabytes of stuff onto the thumb drive. <laughs> yes, it is that slow. It's like really, really slow. It's like 50 minutes. I can download at home uh, 1.2 gigabytes would have taken me like three minutes. And it took 50 minutes to copy that much amount, that amount of data onto the thumb drive. Whew, that was interesting. Okay, so getting back to the, getting back to the program. So the, if given the program is as it is right now, what should it return, okay? Because you know, every time we add some code to the program, we should know how it should behave because you know we need to double check, okay, am I doing everything correctly? So what do you think? If without changing the rest of the program, what should it be returning? We still have ABC and ABD you know, as the strings, and the program just decides, I'm not gonna ask any questions, I'm just gonna return the difference between whatever S1 points to and whatever S2 points to. It would return a zero, yep, it should return a zero, but returning a zero is not very useful because it doesn't tell me whether the subtraction is done in the right order, right? So I want to kind of make some changes here just to kind of tweak it so that it can give me an actual value. So the easiest way is to turn one of these into a null, okay? So I would comment out one line and then just substitute it with a null, okay? So this time, because we are comparing ABC to ABD, so it, would re it, would, it should return zero minus 97, okay? So we'll see whether that's what the program is gonna do or not. Save the code, go to River Spider, just do the whole thing again. Uh, 
and then we switch to the assembler and go to the analysis view there we go and we are looking for the last update to register a so we just have to go all the way down here look at the last time we update register a and it says 9f what does 9f have anything to do with 97 or the subtraction you know 0 minus 97 okay so how do we double check this how do we know this should be the correct value Mm -hmm. It is. It has no sign. Yeah, you're correct. It, it can be seen as unsigned. Usually, we don't associate signedness with hexadecimal numbers. So by the time we use hexadecimal numbers, all we are interested in are the zeros and ones, right? So we want to look at the, these zeros and ones and see if it is representing negative 97. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I will start up the notepad or the uh, tablet because it's just how it, it's easier for me to demonstrate it that way so let me give me a second here to start it up oh that's the wrong window scrcpy dot message there we go mdb kill server one more time huh. okay. there we go Just, I just put it on on the different desktop. Let me move it back to the one that it's supposed to be on. Ah. All right. There we go. All right. So we're going to. We go to notes, we go to, this is the wrong class, go to the right class, Great. there we go. All right, so we want to look at 9F and want to find out and confirm whether that is negative 97 or not. So let's see how we can do that. So we have 9F to begin with. Okay. How many people remember vaguely, approximately, that we have talked about this before? We talked about signed versus unsigned. We talked about two's complement. So all of that stuff is going to be useful now. Because we are suspecting if we do a negative, uh, an, an arithmetic negation to whatever value this is representing, um, we should get 96 back. Okay, 96 is in decimal, 9F is in hexadecimal. But we also know that arithmetic negation is the same thing as two's complement. So that means we are taking two's complement of 1001, 1111, and we are expecting to get 96 back. Yep. Um, yep, you're correct, it's 97. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> so now we look at two's complement. It is one's, the one's complement plus one. One's complement is flipping all the ones and the zeros. So we have zero, one, one, zero, 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 plus one. So that makes it zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. And these are all in base two. All right. So what is that? Well, we got one. 132, 164, and none of 128. So we have these two and this one. 64 plus 32 is 96. 96 plus 1 is indeed 97. So now we know the 9F here. Okay, let me point out. This 9F is indeed 
negative 97. Okay, so that's why we can we, we check because if this is the result that we, we're expecting. So we have to do that first. So this is big, okay? Even though the program is not nearly done, this is big because what it tells me is I can get to whatever S1 is pointing to, I can get to whatever S2 is pointing to. So that means all the comparison for the condition of the, of the ternary expression, I can do that pretty easily now, okay? All right, so we go back to the assembly code. So what I'm also demonstrating is trying to show you guys not to write the program from you know, finish from beginning to finish all in one thing, you know, then you end up with maybe 100 lines of code, and then you try to debug all 100 lines of code at the same time. That is not a good way to use your time. All right, so what we need to do now is to look at this code. Okay, we go back to <clears throat> this subroutine here, and we go like, okay, this is good. Okay, we kind of need to do this eventually, but not yet. So we, we still want to get you know, um, whatever S1 points to and whatever S2 points to. But the first thing we need to do is to just compare, are they the same? Because if they're already the same, I'm done and we can just do the subtraction. So the subtraction part is just gonna be done later on. I can keep that code, but I have to put a label um, and say, you know, just subtract. Okay, so we put a label here because you know, we might have to get there, we may not get there, we'll see. So the first thing we need to do is to compare, okay? Compare AB, um, either way is okay. If you want to say compare BA, it's just as good because all we want to know is are they the same, okay? So that's why you, know, you can compare either way and it's going to be okay. And we only have a conditional jump that is based on zero, it's JZI. So if they're indeed the same, yeah, that means you know, we just want to do the subtract. Um, no, actually, that is not the case. Because if they're the same, I have to check whether you know, um, it's a null or not. So we're going to have to say JCI check um, S1 pointing to a null. Okay. If not, that means, you know, oh, we just have to... Uh, so if we get here, that means A does not equal to B which means, oh, we just need to go to the just subtracting. So uh, it's right next door already, so that's fine. So we can say, uh, well, we can still do a JMPI to just subtract because we have another reason to go to just subtract later on. So now we define the label check S1 null here. Okay, I'm just gonna pause and see if you guys can see that it makes sense, okay? if they are the same, according to this, that means we have to check this. That would be the next thing we have to check, which is represented by line 33 at this point. I haven't specified the actual code to do it. <clears throat> On the other hand, if I fall through, okay, which means you know, A and B are not the same, so that meets this requirement already, but because it is in the OR, so that means the entire OR, the entire disjunction is true, which also means we just have to go to the then expression, which is you know, whatever just subtract is going to do, okay? So now we have to go like, okay, how do we know whether S1 is pointing to a null or not? Whatever S1 is pointing to is still in which register? This is another reason why you want to comment your code because otherwise you may not remember which register has whatever S1 is pointing to. Yes, register A, very good. So now we just say, hmm, let's do an AND AA. Remember that trick? This is going to send register A through the ALU so that it has a chance to you know, change the zero flag and also the sign flag. We don't care about the other flags. The borrow flag, we don't care. I mean, this overflow flag, we don't care. Okay, the L flag, we also don't care. In this case, we just want to know, is it is the Z flag set, okay? So JZI, because that's the only conditional branch that takes a look at the zero flag. If it is zero, then we also just want to go to, you know, just subtract. So just subtract again. So if it falls through, okay, if I cannot get to just subtract up to this point, that means there's no chance I can go there. The C code is redundant because by this time, I know whatever S1 points to is the same as whatever S2 points to. If S1 is not pointing to a null, S2 is not pointing to a null. So, you know, that means, you know, uh, we have to go for the recursion here, okay? 
So we'll, I'll do a JMPI to recursive call, okay? All right, so after just subtract, you know, we have the return value already, then we just do a JMPI to um, SCMP return, and I define SCMP return here. Basically, it is just a label to define, okay, get here when we are ready to return to the caller, and the return value is already in register A. That's what the label, you know, SCMP return is signifying, is we got everything done already. Register A already has the return value. Just go ahead and return to the caller at this point. So now we define yet another label, okay? We define um, recursive call here. And well, we can do this or we can like not do this, okay? So if you want to test your program after writing this many lines of code and you don't want to kind of mess around with a recursive call at this point, that's fine, okay? Just put something into register A um, that is really kind of unique and call it a day. So what do you think is unique that you can put here? It's eight zero. Okay, because 80 is representing negative 128, and no printable character is within the range. The subtraction of printable character would be within the range of negative 128. So that would be a quote unquote illegal you know, return value. You can tell right away, it's like, oh, this is not real. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and LDIA with you know, 128, because that bit pattern should not be a possible return value. Okay, so I got this code already done and I'm gonna run it again. So, so instead of doing a recursive, instead of doing a recursive call, it's, it, it will return uh, 128, which is one followed by seven zeros. <clears throat> but I haven't changed the string back to what it's, it was supposed to be. So that means the strings that we're comparing down here is still a null string compared to ABD. So it should continue to return 9F. Okay, in register A. So now we double check. Okay, we go back to here. We go back to the analysis tab. Everything has shifted a little bit because we added more instructions now. So we can see that it is still returning 9F, which is the right thing to do. Okay, because um, the first string has a null character as the first character, and then the second one has A as the first character, which is 97 in ASCII code. So it's still doing the right thing. Uh, we should test the program again, yeah, but in this case, we'll try to see if we, it will get to the branch that is supposed to do the recursive call, because otherwise the logic is still not right. So we want to double check that. So we change this one back to 97, or we can just uncomment the previous line like that, okay? So this time we are comparing ABC to ABD again. Okay, the comment is wrong. <clears throat> that bothers me. Change it back to what it's supposed to be. So in this case, it is supposed to do the recursive call because the first character are the same and they are not null. So that means we are supposed to go for the recursive call. I did not implement the recursive call. I instead returned 128 or 80 in hexadecimal. As a placeholder, it's like, if I get 128 back, we're good, okay? It means the logic is correct, okay? So we save the code, it is saved, and then we run this again. <clears throat> and you can now see why it is important to get Reaper Spider you know, up and running because now you can just add a few lines, run it again, double check, everything is good, you know, and then you go back and add some more lines. So it really kind of helps speed up the whole process. So now we go back to um, checking here. Okay, so it is returning 8-0. Woohoo! Okay, so I can now confirm that the conditional part of the Turner expression is now correct, okay? I have the right spot to write the recursive call. Everything else seems to be working. Is that okay? So this is not just something that you should, you should do for this class. Every time you write anything that is complex, okay, you want to break it up into smaller chunks of tasks, and then each one should be verifiable. In other words, if I do this, do I understand what the program is supposed to do? Can I verify that the program is doing the right thing, even though it's incomplete? So you should always do that whenever you write programs, okay? 
cool. So now we go back here and now we can finish the entire thing because we just have the recursive call, call to do. And we are doing great in time. All right. So we go back to the point where we're supposed to return the recursive value, which is here. So now we go like, okay, you, you, you can leave now. Okay, we just verify that you're at the right place. So now we have to do the recursive call, which is really just line seven in the C code. So we, so this time it's a little bit complex because we have lost the actual value of S1 and S2 already. What we have in register A and B are the values that they are pointing to, but not the pointers. So I have to recompute the pointers <clears throat> and then add one to each one and then push them on the stack. All right, so let's do that, okay? Um, I will show you one thing that's kind of important here that may be helpful in the Fibonacci program. So I'm gonna do the push in the reverse order just like this, okay? So we will first have to get the value of parameter S2. So that's LDI, LD, yeah, LDI A with um, SCMP S2, add AD, so that will give me the address of S2, LDAA. That will give me the value of parameter S2. And then we do an increment A. That will give me S2 plus 1. And we'll just push it on the stack. Decrement D, uh, STDA. Okay. Well, that doesn't seem too hard, right? I mean, you know, we are just following the usual way of getting to the value of the parameter. And then we add one to it before we push it on the stack. So you would think the next few things that we have to do is kind of the same thing, okay? So we can just do a line 41 to line 46, copy it to here, and then just change your S2 to S1 and be done with it. Unfortunately, that is not the case, okay? This is not gonna get it done for one reason. Can somebody tell me what is the label SCMP underscore S1. What is it, what is it representing? It is the offset from where the stack pointer points to to the to um, whatever S1 is. S1 is one of the parameters. Okay. We changed the stack pointer. Okay. So let me look at, let's show you the diagram because I think once you, once you guys see the diagram, you'll go like, oh, so that's the problem. Okay, so let me wake up the tablet and show you what the problem is. So let's just say that this is the call frame. Okay, this is the frame for SCMP. Uh, it has S2, it has S1, and it has the return address. Okay, and Based on a normal you know, condition, the stack pointer points to the last thing that we push on the stack, which was pushed in this case by the caller, that we the return address. So this is normal, okay? But what we have done at this point is we just pushed the second argument of the recursive call on the stack. So that means now we have used this space here and the value of this thing is S2 plus one. The stack pointer is now pointing here, which means the offset that we have computed earlier is not valid anymore. It's off by one byte because we just decremented the stack pointer by one. So, well, it's not a bad, it's not too hard to fix it, but the important part is to recognize it, okay? So once we recognize that is what's happening, now we just say, eh, just add one to this. So that one plus is accounting for the one decrement that is here, because the stack pointer is no longer what it used to be when we computed the offset to the various items in the frame. Okay, now this kind of thing does not need to happen if we have more registers, because typically on an Intel architecture, one particular register is called the frame pointer, and the frame pointer stays put <laughs> as we push more things on the stack. So that's why, you know, with, a, with certain architectures, you don't have to do messy stuff like this. TTP is a little bit simplistic. We only have four registers. I don't want to allocate the other one to be the frame pointer. Then we only have two general purpose registers left, which is not enough to do you know, all the stuff that we need to do. 
So in this case, we have to do this, do this one plus here. All right, so now that we have both of these pushed, then we can call the subroutine recursively, which means the last thing we have to do is to push the return address. Okay, so this is LDI.6 plus decrement D STDA again. Then we do a JMPI to the subroutine that we're calling. What are we calling again? SCMP, right? Okay. And when it comes back, you know, we have to increment the stack pointer twice because we have two arguments that, is that are still sitting on the stack. The return value is already in register A, which is the right place. So I don't have to do a single thing because the return value of the recursive call is in register A, and I'm supposed to return that in register A. Wait, so that means I don't have to do anything, okay? Do not do a CPRAA because I cannot remember whether CPRAA is also hijacked. It makes sense to hijack it, right? You know, why would you copy a register to itself without touching the ALU? All right, so I am suspecting this program is done, okay, that it is complete at this point, okay? Because when it falls through, when this is all done, it just simply goes to the return point of the entire function, which is the, us the, the usual thing that we do to return to the caller. All right, so now what should we expect to see on the stack? now that the whole program is done, right? So let's try to figure that out, okay? Now, this is where the C code, the, little, the earlier demonstration in GDB of the C code comes in handy because the assembly code is going to mirror exactly that, okay? We're gonna have recursion and we're gonna have multiple frames and then each frame is representing one particular thing. So what we'll do is we're gonna take a look at <clears throat> what the stack should look like at this point. Or, you know, when we are all done, what should they do? Okay. So the first few locations would be coming from the entry point of the entire thing. So we have a return address from main back to the entry point. Okay, so this is, you know, this is the frame for main. And then we have the first invocation of string compare from main, okay? So we have... Um, we basically have um, A, B, C, A, B, D, and then A, B, C. Now, when I use A, B, D, A, B, C, it is the labels, okay? These are, re they're referencing the label. I'm just gonna add the double underscore just so it's extra clear. So they serve as S1 and S2, okay? S1 and S2 of the function call to SCMP. This is return address again, okay? So this is the first call to SCMP. And in C, this would be ABC versus ADD. This is the first call. But because A is the same as A and neither is a null, we have to call again. So that we'll have a second invocation. So the second invocation is going to have ABD plus one, ABC plus one, and then another return address. This, one re this return address returns back to the previous invocation. So this is another frame. This frame is representing SCMP, BC, and BD that we saw earlier in the demonstration in GDB. And then after that, we look at B versus B. They are the same. Neither is a null. So we have to, re we have to do the recursion one more time. So that gives us underscore, underscore, ABD, two plus, underscore, underscore, ABC, two plus, another return address. And this is the third invocation of SCMP. And this will correspond to you know, the, uh, the third character, which is C, versus the third character, which is a D. And at which point, you know, the recursion would stop because C and D are different. So it would return negative one at this point, back to the previous one, back to the previous one, back to main. So this is what we're expecting, which also means if you think about the locations on the stack that we'll be using, <clears throat> this is FF, this is FE, FD, FC, FB, FA, E, oh, this is F9, F8, 
F7, we will get all the way down to F6, okay? And we know the values too, because by the time we assemble, we'll know what the return addresses should be. We already know you know, where to find the labels, so we can double check that you know, by the time we get to location F7, that we are actually looking at whatever ABC is defined, but plus two, okay? So we can check all of those things. So once again, I am anticipating what the program should do in terms of stack operation and also content on the stack before I even run the code in uh, River Spider. Because this is the only way to debug a program, is you know what it is supposed to do, and you can compare the actual outcome of the program against what you think it should do. If they are the same, we're good. It doesn't mean 100% that we are always good, okay? We can have a, um, a masking effect, like one bug cancels out the other one. So you can still end up with a problem, but it's unlikely. But when they're different, you know for sure that we have a problem because what you're expecting is not what you're getting when you run the code. So either your understanding of what the program should do is incorrect or the implementation is incorrect or both. So now we can actually run the code and see whether this is what we're getting back when the code runs. So here we go, we get to here. <clears throat> and I think I saved the code first. Oh. I forgot. Okay, do it one more time. I have to go into that script and uh, check the timestamp of the file. So if the timestamp of the file is more than, say, 10 seconds <laughs> from the actual time I used the script, it will give me a warning. It's like, looks like you forgot to save the file again, tag. And I'll use exactly that phrase. I'll modify the script. All right. So we get back to everything is good, right? Yeah, because it says your know, trace data uploaded. All right. So now we look into the update of the stack, okay? Because you know, the, the program does get very tedious at this point. So we want to go to column C only and see what we're updating on the stack. So at location FB, we get a 50, a 52 in hexadecimal. All right. So is that the right thing that we should be getting? In other words, we look at location, what again? Uh, FB, so FB is supposed to be uh, whatever the label A, B, D is, plus one, okay? So how can we check that? We go back to the assemble tab. There are a few ways to do it. You can look at the symbol table as well, but the assemble tab can give you that information. So we just go look for A, B, which one again? <laughs> it is uh, A, B, D, okay? So we go to label A, B, D, down, 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 down. Okay, this is label ABD, and it's 5-1, so we should be looking at the next location, which is the 5-2. Is that what we got in the trace? It is a 5-2. Okay, that works. So I'm just spot checking right now, but I should check every single one until I look at the entire stack content. So when we look at the picture from earlier, it should go all the way down to F6, and F7 should be ABC plus two. Okay, so we will check that location. So it's gonna be a lot further down. So we look, go to F7. <clears throat> all right, so F7 is 4F. So 4F you know, should be ABC plus two, which means ABC itself should be a 4D. So now we go back to the assemble tab, there are other ways to check this too. Um, you can go to the symbol table. It's really kind of messy. It's no better. <laughs> so we'll just kind of go ahead and look at ABC. So ABC is right here. It is at location 40. So everything checks out at this point. Um, if you want to check the last one, okay, the last one is location F6. This is the return address back to SCMP um, right after the recursive call. So what we do is we go back into the assemble tab and check that too, okay? So we have to go to the recursive call and we are looking at it right now. This is the, um, the location right after the recursive call. It is at location three, five. So we are expecting location F6 to have the content of three, five. And because that's the return address here. 
So now we go back to the uh, analysis tab. And yep, it is a 3.5. So I feel fairly comfortable that the program is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But the most important part is, am I returning the correct value in register A, which should be a negative one, which is also FF in hexadecimal. So after all this, doo -doo -doo -doo, the last update is indeed an FF before it starts to return. So that's how I would write a program like this. And I've been teaching this class for, okay, maybe 12 years, since 2010, okay? So that's about 13 years. So I've done this many, many times, but even I cannot write this code from start to finish without making a mistake. I have to do it step by step, check along every single step, and then do it again. So that's what I would recommend when you are writing your code for the two homework assignments. One is due on Monday, the other one is due on Wednesday but they are very much related. Both of them are really just testing. Do you understand the caller callee agreement? Do you know how to access your parameters? Do you know how to allocate for local variables? Do you know how to access items on the stack? Okay, and once you're done with the first program, the second program is like, mm, it's about the same thing, not a whole lot harder. But I also want to, let me look at the time. I still have two more minutes. So I do want to go to the um, homework assignment and give you an alternate presentation um, of the Fibonacci program, which is the recursive one. And well, I don't have to do it here. I can do it here because I still have the code from uh, Monday, from Tuesday, sorry, from Tuesday. So I'm gonna save this. I will send this to you, you know, so that you guys have something to comment on you know, as part of your um, review of the topic. So, um, when you look at the program for the Fibonacci program, which is uh, fib.c, the C code, there are two ways to look at the recursive version of the Fibonacci algorithm. From line four to line seven is what the homework assignment gives you, okay? That's one way to do the, uh, rec that's one way to express the recursive version of Fibonacci. That can be a little bit harder to implement, okay? So I'm giving you an alternative implementation in C, which is from line nine to line 19. It looks a lot longer, but it spells out everything that you need to do. So even the little temporary variable thing, the return value, it is hidden in the first version of the code. You have to put it somewhere, okay? The question is, where are you gonna put it? And then you can retrieve it later on. The answer is the stack, okay? We have already demonstrated, we have already seen one example where we have to push something on the stack and then later on retrieve it. But in case you did not remember that or cannot you get, it, get it working, then you use an explicit local variable here, then you don't have to go for that trick. So either one is okay, okay? You can implement either the original or the really, really spelled out version. It's up to you, okay? The second version is gonna be a little bit lengthier but it's easier to understand and easier to follow. The first one is going to be more compact, but you know, it's harder to debug. So that's up to you. All right, any questions? Yep. Um, I have a question about the code from the last class, mm -hmm. where you're creating a local variable. Mm -hmm. You're talking about pushing it on the stack, but I, I thought that when you return to the main, it was still on the stack. So, yeah. okay, so. So that description, okay, I'm, I'm, I need a little bit more clarification of what you what do you mean it is still on the stack? Um, do you mean the, the, the value is still on the stack or do you mean it is still above or at where the stack pointer points to? I thought it was still, actually, I thought there was no operation in the code itself to pop it from the stack before you pop the return address or return. And so that's what I was confused by on this. I think it probably had an increment D to deallocate it. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. So I think that's it for today's lecture. Um, just one more item that I want to kind of bring up before we end today's class. Um, the final exam is open book, open notes, just like exam one and two. It, the format is already known. Okay. What I'll do is I'll give you something like this, okay? I'll give you the C code, and I'll give you the assembly code. That is faulty. I would artificially introduce problems 
in the assembly code. And then your job is to fix the assembly code. So that means you really have to understand the C concept. You have to understand how to implement the C concept. But I will also tell you one thing, you know, like by the way, so that you're not going to be surprised, is I can give you implementations that are not the standard implementation, but it still ends up doing the same thing. Okay, so that means do not overstudy in the sense of, okay, this sequence maps to that concept. This sequence maps to that concept. Do not do the hard mapping. Instead, look at the effect that we need. What do we need to put on the stack? I can give you different ways to put the same thing on the stack. So you still have to recognize, oh, pff, this is really doing the same thing that we used to do it in this particular sequence. So that is important, okay? I, do, I want to bring this up as early as possible so that you guys are aware of that, so that you can think about, okay, if this is one way of doing this, can I think of some other way to accomplish exactly the same thing? So that's gonna be some thought exercise for you guys to do as you're writing the code for this, you know, for the homework assignments. All right, so that's it. I, unless there are questions, I can stop the recorder. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. When you don't have a C compiler? <laughs> or when there's no environment for a C code, for C code. So what do you need in order for C code to work? You need a C compiler. You also need a stack, right? You need to know that you are, you have a certain, you have the memory space already set up. So when, when you start up a processor, do you have, do you know where the RAM is located or how much RAM you have and all of that stuff? The answer is no. So you have no environment to run C code in certain types of, you know, situations. Then you have no choice but to boil down to assembly. Okay, second question. Can you write the entire operating system like Linux or Windows in C? Who provides the stack? for a program to run, the operating system, right? So that means something, at least a portion of the operating system cannot be written in C because nobody is saying, hey, use this as the stack. So um, with every type of operating system, there is at least a portion of the code in the kernel that cannot be written in C. That's, it simply has to be written in assembly language. Um, so that's kind of one of the thing. Um, I'll, I'll give you guys one more pointer since you asked that question. I know it's not 100% relevant to this class, but it does relate to what you just asked me. So we'll go to um, drtechknowledgebase.org and we'll get to, I cannot remember the link to that thing. Okay, give me a second, I can look it up. Um, because I wrote a real-time kernel and it is related to what we are talking about. Um, I think it's underdeveloped. There we go. Uh, me develops. Okay, there we go. So this is a real-time kernel that I wrote a long time ago. It's not an operating system. It is just a real-time kernel, which means it has multi-threading capability. It has round robin, um, time slicing. Um, it can handle priority queues and uh, between the threads they can communicate using semaphores and so on, okay? Yes, I know most of you are thinking you're just talking gibberish. It won't be gibberish when you take the upper division operating system class at a four-year university. But of course, at that point, you will have completely forgotten what I said today. <laughs> but the point is, the real-time kernel itself cannot be written in C because it has to manipulate multiple stacks. It has to take control away from a thread and go like, oh, I'm going to have to save all the registers on this stack here, and then we go to the other stack, pop all the registers back to continue with the other thread. That code cannot be written in C because it has to do certain types of low-level access that C does not provide. So this entire thing is written in assembly, um, and also when you write code in C, the footprint tends to be medium, it's not large, this is really compact. The entire real-time kernel is two kilobytes. 
and it lives on a device that only has eight kilobytes of code space. So that also necess necessitates the use of assembly languages. You don't have the space for your C programs. So I hope that kind of answers some of the question. Yep. It's written for the, uh, you know, what was known as the Atmel AVR, you know, MCUs. Um, one company, you know, cannot remember the name of the company. Uh, the company that made the processor for the Parallax uh, robots, PIC, you know, that's the line of the processor. But anyway, the company got bought by another company, so it's not called Atmel anymore. But it's the same kind of processor that people use on the Arduino. So I, you know, so technically speaking, this real-time kernel can work with Arduino. So it gives you full multi-threading capability with time slicing and all the other good stuff. <laughs> that was my uh, summer project. It's, this is this is a hobby. So anyway, so that's kind of the the, uh, the rationale of teaching this class. The other thing about this class is we are we are looking at how C code is implemented in assembly. That by itself is useful too, because the question is, what if you're accessing a local array, an array that's a local variable beyond its boundary, and you end up corrupting stuff on the stack? What can you possibly corrupt? A lot of things, including the return address. So you can write a program where it corrupts the stack in a certain way so that you can have main to call function f, and then f just returns to some other function that you have never called. You go like, what is happening here? I never called a function. How can I possibly return to a function that I never called? If you corrupt the stack, that can happen. The other, th the other one that is even more fun is you corrupt the frame pointer that was saved on the stack. The symptom of this is all the var local variables are shifted. Okay, let's just say that you declare x, y, z as your local variables. x becomes y, y becomes z, z becomes something else. After you return from a function, it's like, what is happening here? Well, guess what? Some of the functions that you called corrupted something on the stack. You know, the saved frame pointer got corrupted, and that's the symptom. So that's why you know, this class is helpful, because you know, now that you understand everything is living on the stack, and an array is nothing appointed to a certain point and go like, this is the beginning of the array. And if you overwrite stuff beyond the boundary of the array, then you can corrupt stuff on the stack. And that can explain a lot of unexplainable side effects of programs that are not written correctly. So that is actually one of the most important part of this class. I see. Yeah, the other one is not about writing, it's about understanding. So if you ever want to hack a program, like, you know, I want to give myself an infinite number of lives in the game, <laughs> being able to disassemble the program and locate the logic of when it decrements the number of lives that you have can be very helpful because you can just go like, oh, this is the code that decrements the number of lives that I have. No up, no up, no up, no up. Just fill up the whole thing with no ups. It's like, okay, now I can live forever in the game. And I'm pretty sure that is you know, really of high importance in our daily life, right? You know, so now you can play that game forever without dying. All right, so I hope that kind of helped to explain the context of this class a little bit. All of this stuff here is gonna come back later on when you take um, the operating system class as the upper division class, or for those of you who are interested in compilers, what, does, what do compilers do? All the stuff that we are doing right now by hand, right? So that's gonna be handy as well if you want to get into compiler writing. Cool, okay. So talking about all of this stuff makes me want to go through college again. <laughs> Just knock myself with a stick, just make sure I forget everything, and then go through the whole process again. All righty, so I, I'll let you guys get started with the lab today. It's a really easy one. You know, only got three questions. They're not hard at all. The whole point of this lab is, 
it doesn't make a difference. Okay, calling a subroutine from somewhere else and calling the subroutine from itself makes no differences whatsoever. Okay, that's kind of the whole point of the three-point you know quiz for today's lab. But the assignment itself is difficult, so you might want to stay behind if you want to get you know River Spider working or if you want to ask questions about your the program. So I'll be here until the last student leaves in today's class. Yep. Oh, right, right. Okay, forget about that too. All right, so today's lab is, I think, recursion. Yeah, let me look it up. It's Fib. Fib for Fib Fibonacci. Yes, not the other meaning of Fib. And once again, I would advise using the GDB to kind of figure out what the C code is supposed to do before you even try that in assembly code. <clears throat> um, I will send a few announcements. One is the starting point of the Fibonacci program because I did not give you the main code of Fibonacci. So I'm gonna send it by announcement. And then the other one is going to be the string compare program that I did today. And it would be probably a good exercise for you to kind of add comments to it, you know, just so that you know what each line is going to do, what it's, what it's doing, and why we have to do it. So that's what I'll do. And I can stop the recorder now. <laughs>